beloved brothers and sisters and friends, <clears throat> I fully subscribe to all that President Smith has just said, and I testify that he is God's prophet upon the earth today. History repeats itself, and we need only to return to the past to learn the solutions for the present and the future. The Corinthians seem to have been troubled by the same conflicting messages that we hear in our own time. Paul told them, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? There are so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. Paul's was an impressive voice, powerful and strong, never silenced even in all the interim centuries. There are voices all about us. Some are harsh and raucous, others are sweet and penetrating. Paul's revelations included visions of these latter days. His voice is saying, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Voices again, rasping voices, proclaiming doctrines of devils, saying there is no sin, there is no devil, there is no God, saying that we will, let, we will eat, drink, and be merry, like the antediluvians who never did believe that the flood would really come. Many voices of <clears throat> seducing spirits advocate carnal pleasures and unrestrained physical satisfactions. We're living in the last days, and they are precarious and frightening. The shadows are deepening, and the night creeps in to envelop us. The clear voice of Paul again in the last days Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unholy, without natural affection, incontinent, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. A prominent columnist wrote of our day, one thing is certain, we shall be given no centuries for a leisurely and comfortable decay. We have an enemy now, remorseless, crude, brutal, and cocky, who believes that we are in an advanced state of moral decline and ripening for the kill. Many are without natural affection. Family life is eroding as they seek to satisfy their own selfish wants. There are said to be millions of perverts who have relinquished their natural affection and bypassed courtship and normal marriage relationships. This practice is spreading like a prairie fire and changing our world. They are without natural affection for God, for spouses, and even for children. Paul speaks of continent a word almost forgotten by this world. Still in the dictionary, it means self-restraint in sexual activities. Many good people being influenced by the bold spirit of the times are now seeking surgery for the wife, for the husband, so that they may avoid pregnancies and comply with the strident voice demanding a reduction of children. It was never easy to bear and rear children, but easy things do not make for growth and development. But loud, blatant voices today shout fewer children and offer the pill, drugs, surgery, and even unholy abortion to accomplish that. Strange the proponents of depopulating the earth seem never to have known the word continents. 
libraries are loaded with books with shocking pictures showing people how to totally satisfy their animal natures. But few books are found on the self-control and continence. With a theory that life is for sex, every imagination of the minds of men devise ways to more completely get what they call sexual fulfillment, which they demand at the expense of all else, family, home, and eternal life. There should be, from the press and the lecture platform and pulpit, deep and resounding voices urging man to rise above the carnal and to rest his mind on things clean and sacred. Paul preached continence and uh, self-mastery. He practiced it, being years in the mission field. Was not that his meaning when he said, for I would? that all men were even as I myself, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Paul speaks of lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Does that not describe the wanton sex permissiveness of our own day? Paul speaks of those who, quote, creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers' lusts. Immorality seems to receive now the wink of approval of many once honorable people. Debauchery never gave birth to good of any kind. And Paul said, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. But now comes a heavenly voice, thou shalt not commit adultery. And re he that committeth adultery and repenteth not shall be cast out. Many voices, loud and harsh, come from among educators, business and professional men, sociologists and psychologists, authors, movie, movie actors, legislators, judges, and others, and even from the clergy who, because they have learned a little about something, seem to think they know all about everything. This egotism and pride is prompted by the cunning father of lies. Hear the voice of a Nephite prophet describing their acceptance of the cunning plan of the evil one. To be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. When they are learned, they think they are wise supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and they shall perish. Peter's voice was sure when he called the evil ones brute beasts and would perish in their own corruption. He called them spots and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, having eyes full of adultery beguiling unstable souls. He speaks of their lusts of the flesh through much wantonness and those who return to their sin after having been cleansed, he likens to the dog returning to its vomit and the, the sow that has been washed to her wallowing in the mire. Sustaining Peter, the voice of Paul again to Titus, unto the pure all things are pure but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Much has been said about the frustration of youth. While we can hardly justify their eccentricities and disobedience, their apparent loss of faith, perhaps part of the blame for their frustrations can be laid at the feet of those parents who gave them an example of disobedience to government and God's laws. <coughs> Certainly some blame can be attached to the voices from lecture platforms, editorial rooms, or broadcasting stands, and even from the pulpit. Such voices may have to answer 
for their perpetuating of falsehood and their failure to give true leadership in combating evil. As with the people, so with the priest. The term priest, as here used, uh, denotes all religious leaders of any faith. Isaiah said, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. From among the discordant voices, we are shocked at such priests which encourage the defilement of men and wink at the eroding trends and who deny God. Certainly these men should be holding firm, yet some yield to the popular clamor. I cite some quotes from the press. Many churchmen are reluctant to give a definite yes or no to marijuana. It depends upon the circumstances, they say. They've developed a situation ethics which seem to cover all sins. Other relig religious leaders are saying precise rules of Christian conduct should not necessarily apply to problems of sexuality. In contrast, we hear the strong voice of a prophet, Peter, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, and uh, privately shall bring about damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Only this month the press quoted a retired head of a populist church proposing the revival of the old style, old style betrothals, which would permit young unmarried couples to sleep together with the church's blessing, and it would not be regarded in the moral sense as fornication. And now the voice of a commentator. Recently, the screen industry solemnly announced that henceforth perversion and homosexuality would be no longer barred from the screen. We're drowning our youngsters in violence, cynicism, and sadism piped into our very living rooms. <clears throat> Quoting from fairly recent publication, the Blank Church Conference today approved recommendation that homosexuality between consenting adults should no longer be considered an offense. That voice from a much-read magazine, a group of blank ministers in San Francisco thinks the churches ought to drop their strictures against homosexuals. It was reported that groups of ministers and their wives recently attended a party given by the homosexuals and lesbians to raise funds for the perversion program. The minister quoted is reported to have said, two people of the same sex can express love and deepen that love by sexual intercourse. Those are ugly voices. They're loud and raspy. Why do we speak in this vein? Why do we call to repentance when there are such pleasant subjects to talk about. It's because someone must warn the world of its doom if life does not change its direction. We remember Pope's verse, vice is a monster of so frightful mean as to be hated need but to be seen, yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. Some voices must cry out against these things. Ours cannot remain silent. To the great Moses, these perversions were an abomination and a defilement, worthy of death. To Paul, it was unnatural, unmanly, ungodly, and a dishonorable passion of an adulterous nature, and would close all the doors to the kingdom. When parents are indiscriminate in their sex behavior, when writers, authors, religious leaders, and others condone such transgression, how can we save from the darkness 
the bewildered, frustrated youth a hitching post they need, a safe harbor they need. One prominent voice booms out that there are many steepled edifices in which the word sin has not been mentioned for a long, long time and a preachment against it cannot be remembered. In direct contrast to the permissive voices comes a voice of authority from the Lord's Church. Man is a biological unit, said J. Reuben Clark, Jr., an animal, but he is more than this. He is the temple of an immortal spirit. The spirit can be defiled by the flesh, and defilement comes when the laws of chastity are violated. Our very civilization itself is based upon chastity, the sanctity of marriage, and the holiness of the home. Destroy these, and Christian man becomes a brute. The family relationship continues through eternity. It is the loftiest and most sacred human relationship we know. The voice of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is unmistakable in the terms, in its warning. Sexual sin, they say, the illicit sexual relations of men and women stands in its enormity next to murder. The Lord has drawn no essential distinctions between fornication, adultery, harlotry, or prostitution. Each has fallen under his solemn and awful condemnation. Such cannot escape the punishments and the judgments which the Lord has declared against this sin. The day of reckoning will come just as certainly as night follows day. Then, speaking of those who condone and justify the evil, whether from press or microphone or pulpit, they continued. They who would palliate the crime and say that such indulgence is but a sinless gratification of a normal desire, like appeasing hunger and thirst, speak filthiness from their lips. Their counsel leads to destruction. Their wisdom comes from the father of lies. Then comes the vibrant voice of Paul again. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Sex involvement outside of marriage locks the doors to temples and thus bars the way to eternal life. We extend to every listener a cordial invitation to come to the watered garden to the shade of pleasant trees, to the unchangeable truth. Come with us to the sureness, security, and consistency. Here the cooling waters flow. The spring does not go dry. Come, listen to a prophet's voice, and hear the word of God. The Lord does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His church stands firm and unchangeable. Sin will not be tolerated, but sincere repentance will be rewarded with forgiveness. The Lord who suffered for us says, I command you, I command you to repent, lest your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, how hard to bear you know not, for behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore? May the voices of the Lord's servants prevail. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.